Hi everyone, this is Robert and welcome to IDG Live. Today we are looking at House Arryn. This is the third, I think, in our series looking at the houses in the Vale, uh, the great houses in the Vale. We've done the north already in the Riverlands, now we're into the Vale of Arryn. Um, and obviously um, House Arryn is the, uh, the, the, the Lord's Paramount of the Vale, um, and they've got quite a, quite a storied history. Um, and yet, at the same time, I, I think we we tend not to know huge amounts about them, other than the, sort of the people who are behind me here, um, and a little bit about maybe what's going on in the plot in A Song of Ice and Fire. So we're going to uh, unpack uh, a lot of that today. As always, I'm going to frame this around questions from my patrons. I'll pick up all the questions I can in the chat. Um, but I will start with a, a bit of an overview of who uh, they are. And let's uh, get the... Uh, the map up, as always, this is quartermaster.info. Please do go and support them if you can. I think they make excellent maps, uh, or an excellent interactive map of uh, Westeros and Essos. So uh, let's look at House Arryn. House Arryn um, are Andals. They come from Essos, and they consider themselves to be part of the oldest and purest of the um, the Andal houses, Andal heritage. We often think about you know, the first men and um, how far people can trace their ancestry back in Westeros. When it comes to House Arryn, uh, only the, the the most recent part, it's thousands of years, but the, only the most recent part of their history has actually been uh, based here in Westeros. So, um, they came over, they, they weren't, although they were from a sort of a storied and ancient um, lineage, they weren't, to start with, the biggest and most important Andal house during the invasion. And remember the invasion, the Andal invasion of uh, Westeros and the Vale, which was the first part of the Westeros, which they uh, took over. This wasn't a massive fleet coming over and, and attacking. This was a kind of a drip, drip, drip of... Um, Im armed immigration is probably a good way of saying it. Um, a, a group would come over and then another group would come over and then another group would come over. There'd be a battle here. There'd be uh, a, a marriage between two families over there. And slowly but surely, the, the makeup of the veil was changed, often by force. And as we looked at uh, when we were looking at House Royce um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, House Royce, as a first men family, they eventually took a stand. They led um, a coalition of the remaining first men houses um, and uh, against these Andal invaders and tried to pick them off one by one. Robar the second Royce was this last uh, king of the first men. And eventually the Andals got their act together. Uh, created something akin to a united army and found somebody to lead them in battle. Probably the greatest knight or leader uh, at the time, this guy called Artis Arryn. Now, we talked a little bit about the, uh, the Battle of the Seven Stars, uh, so I'm not going to go over that in detail. Suffice to say that Artis Arryn uh, had made sure the battle was fought on his home territory where he knew, just at the base of the giant's lance. And that advantage um, allowed him to take the First Men army by surprise, outflank them, a little bit of trickery about um, uh, pretending to have somebody else dressed up to uh, to look like him in our in his armor um while he led some troops around to in an outflanking maneuver but the Arryns won and from that moment the first men had to bend the knee incidentally the some some of the first men didn't bend the knee at that point we talk about this as being the the great victory for the Andals. Some of the first men did not bend the knee, and they became what we now know as the Mountain Clan. So that's where they came from. They weren't just always there. These were the first men who refused to accept uh, the uh, the Arons as their kings. 
And the Erins uh, styled themselves um, as the the kings uh, of the uh, the kings of mountain and vale. Uh, and they, if you look at the the map here, you will see that um, the area, which is right in the center there, um, and at the base of it, the giant's lance is this huge hill, huge mountain, um, and at the base of it, the gates of the moon, which was a castle which was a stronghold which was there uh, for quite a long time and then they over the course of generations built at the height at the top of this mountain they built the Eyrie. Now this became the centre, it is geographically very very close to the centre uh, anyway of uh, the region but it's uh, there one end of the the Vale itself, the Vale of Arryn, this incredibly fertile strip of land, which is is only twenty or so miles across. You can see from sort of side to side, uh, from edge to edge, but and it, but it's incredibly fertile and grows. You can grow enough crops there to feed all of uh, uh, the people of the the region. It's also strategically placed in that the one pass that we have through the mountains of the moon which comes through the bloody gate um, takes you all the way up to uh, the eerie now once they'd got this castle on the top of the hill this was considered impregnable and it it was pretty much until dragons which we'll talk about in just one moment but if you read that early chapter um in Game of Thrones book one, uh, you will find when Cat goes up there with Tyrion um, and uh, she's taken him as a captive to the Eyrie, this is really hard work getting up there. It, it's not something that um, many you know, an, an army could easily do. There were three way forts along the way. It's single file. It's rocky. At one point, you have to get on uh, basically mountain trained mountain donkeys just to get along the path, or you would probably fall off. Um, at the very top, you can't easily just sort of walk up there. You either have to be climbing up a ladder or get pulled up on this kind of winch pulley system. This is an when they say it's impregnable. This is what they you could defend that against pretty much any army because they can only come at you one at a time. So this added to the feel of the Vale of Arryn as a whole as being um, uh, able to just sort of cut itself off from the west rest of Westeros if it wished. It had the, the mountain range, which you can see there, the Mountains of the Moon, which physically cut it off from most of the, the rest of Westeros. Uh, yes, there was the, there were the ports of Gulltown and some smaller ports around the side there, but even if you managed to get in, you couldn't take the capital. So this, I think, has fed in over the centuries to this um, feel amongst House Arryn, um, and the Vale as a whole, that they sort of do keep themselves to themselves. And over the course of the next few thousand years, we don't have huge amounts of information about what happened. Um, a couple of legends, which I can touch on in, in a little bit. I've got some questions about them. But uh, the only uh, bits of history that we really hear about are there there was a, an ongoing battle for quite some time uh, with the Starks over the uh, the sisters the islands there in the, the bite you can see the uh, just above the Vale of Arryn but just south of the north um, there's a patch of water in in which there are several islands, three islands in particular, the sisters, um, and there was a bit of a fighting about that. There's a f another few uh, smaller islands like uh, the Pebble um, uh, and Witch Isle that don't really pay, play huge amounts of uh, a role in the story, uh, but they get captured by the Arons as well. There's a few attempted sort of invasions and incursions from some slavers over in Essos um, and uh, a few raiders, but 
it it comes to nothing. And so for most of this time, the Vale is just ruled relatively peacefully by the Arins. And the only real threat to them comes from the occasional raids from the mountain clans. So um, that's the, the story for quite some time. And... Um, when then we get to the Targaryen invasion. Now, at the time Aegon's Aegon's conquest, the Targaryen invasion. Now, uh, this was something which obviously the Arryns had been very aware of as a possibility for a while. Um, if you again, if you look at the map, Dragonstone is just there, sort of like basically off to the southeast. It's off the east coast of. Uh, Westeros uh, and the Vale is um, not that far away so they will have been aware of this they will probably have seen the dragons flying every now and then and so when the Targaryens invaded they were ready quite quickly and there was a plan of an invasion to start with uh, from the Targaryens. They they landed in what became known as King's Landing later, the, the city built up where uh, Aegon landed, uh, hence the name, if you never realised that's where, why it was called, King's Landing, it's because that's where King Aegon first landed. Um, but they sent off a fleet to try and take Gulltown, which is the city, uh, the only city in uh, the Vale and the main sort of access port. This was led by the Velaryons, the Targaryens' great uh, allies, long-time allies, and a guy named Daemon Velaryon uh, led it. Now, the the Vale, the Arryns, had got a fleet ready uh, to fight them, and the Arryns won. The Velaryons were defeated. However, what then happened was Visenya on Rhaegar thought, well, I'm not having any of that. And then Vagar burned the Arryn fleet, which led to what the historians, if you read um, The World of Ice and Fire, Fire and Blood, basically said it was a it was a draw. Although the strategic victory they say, they claim was for House Arryn because the Targaryens then sort of took a step back and said, OK, well, we'll let's not worry about that uh, invasion and uh, trying to take Gulltown. We'll deal with that a bit later. A bit later, though, wasn't very far in the future because Visenya went back and this time she was flying Vega and she landed at the Eyrie. The Eyrie, you have to remember, all this time, House Arryn have considered their home impregnable. That's the word which is used all the time. You, nobody can take the Eyrie. This, no army can ever invent. They are safe. We, we get echoes of this much later, and certainly with Lysa Arryn when she's there. She's saying, no, I, nobody can touch us here. This, this is impregnable, this castle. Um, but dragons can fly in. So Vagar flew right up to the top of the mountain, landed in the Eyrie. Uh, at the time, the lord uh, was just a child, Ronald Arryn. Um, and uh, Visenya landed and uh talked to him and by the time the um i think it was his mother um at the time shara Arryn, uh she was the queen regent by the time she arrived he was sat on visenya's knee and basically wanting to go on a dragon flight um a very quick negotiation happened uh the Arryns realized that the Eyrie was no longer impregnable, uh, and if, if Vagar could come and destroy their castle at a moment's notice, they bent the knee. Ronald Arryn got his flight on, on a dragon, um, and uh, they stayed as what then, well, they were demoted from being kings, but then became Lords Paramount of the Vale. So, and this was the Vale of Arryn. So they, they kept their status, although like the Starks, for example, they had to give up being kings. Now, um, 
sort of moving a little bit forward from there, we we next see the Arons appear um, most significantly around the time of Jaehaerys and Viserys. Now, you will probably, if you're watching uh, the first episode of House of the Dragon, you'll have picked up that Emma, um, Visenya's wife, was his first wife. Uh, Viserys is uh, not Visenya's wife. <laughs> that would have been a different story. Uh, Viserys's uh, wife, Emma, was an Arryn. Emma Arryn. Um, now she had. She was actually the daughter of a Targaryen and an Arryn. Um, so this was like she was half Targaryen, half Arryn. Um, and this is important because when this plays out into the Dance of the Dragons, uh, what you find is that Rhaenyra considers herself to, to be part Arryn, uh, to the extent that when she has her own uh, standard, uh, her own sigil heraldry, basically, it's, uh, it's, it's quartered. Two dragons, the Targaryen part of her heritage, one um, seahorse to mark the fact that she uh, had been married to uh, into the Valarion family, um, and then also the sigil of House Arryn. Um, so that's uh, quite how important this was to Rhaenyra. And there's also, and we can come back to this, Jane Arryn at the time um, was, she was the, the ruling lady of the Vale. She was only there because of a similar-ish um, dispute about inheritance to the one that Rhaenyra was about or was facing, uh, which was that uh, Jane Arryn inherited as the uh, the daughter of the eldest son, but this was disputed by uh, a son of the second son. So it was a matter of are women allowed to inherit? Um, and in the Vale, uh, because Jane Arryn, who was quite an indomitable figure, it, it would appear, um, she managed to hold on to power. And so when Rhaenyra sent Gisaris to um, the Eyrie to try and get her support, her support was very clear for two good reasons. Firstly, because Rhaenyra was family. But secondly, Jane Arryn's own claim to be the uh, the Lady of the Vale was based on the same principle that allowed Rhaenyra to claim to be um, the rightful heir to the Iron Throne. So uh, there, there's a... Um, and I hope that they show this on the TV show. I, they have, I believe, they've cast Jane Arryn, which would be excellent. Um, but... You have to say that the um, the Vale subplot is not huge, a huge part of the, the Dance of the Dragons, so it's entirely possible that they might play this down and not show us huge amounts about what it is. Uh, trying to, if, if, you, if you're going to cut something out for reasons of, of time or simplicity of narrative, then perhaps the Vale would be one of the bits that you would do, or you would uh, take out. Um... Right, now moving on to um, probably the next uh, most... Uh, I mean, they, they got involved a bit in the Blackfire Rebellions. We talked about that briefly last time as well. Um, uh, but John Arryn is where we really pick up this story. Uh, John Arryn is... Um, he's the Lord of the Vale. Um, just before Robert's Rebellion. Now, he has, at this time, he's not hes not an old man. He's, I think, in his late 40s, 50s, something like that. Uh, but he's had two uh, marriages, neither of which produced any children. His heir at the time is his nephew. And um, he takes on a couple of foster children, um, Robert Baratheon and Ned Stark. And they grow very close to each other and also to him. They view him as being this kind of foster father figure, second father uh, to both of them. 
And when the the moments that build up to Robert's Rebellion start to play out, um, you get this alleged abduction of uh, Leanna Stark. Um, Brandon Stark gets uh, furious about this, and he heads down to King's Landing demanding um, to see Rhaegar. Rhaegar's obviously not there. Eris captures him and the people who's with who are with him, one of whom incidentally happens to be John Arryn's heir. Brandon and the people with him, with, with one exception, uh, Glover, uh, Ethan Glover, um, are all killed. Aerys II then demands that John Arryn gives up Ned Stark and Robert Baratheon to him as well. And it's that that sparks the rebellion. We think of this as Robert's rebellion because Robert is the person who emerged as king at the end of all of this. But the decision, as much as anybody else's, to have a rebellion was John Arryn's because it was to him that Aerys made the demand. He, he says, give up those two guys, hand them over. And John said no. And the moment he said no, that was it. That was going to be war. Um, at which point Robert Baratheon went south, Ned Stark went north, went rally their forces. Eventually they came together and the battle was joined. Um, in order to establish the alliance that they needed to get the strength that they needed for this uh, rebellion to work however um they needed to get more allies together the, the 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 key ally was the riverlands um now the starks had got a marriage pact that was just about to to happen brandon was going to be marrying cat uh, catlin tully brandon died and it was relatively easy, probably not easy for, for him, but relatively easy politically for Ned Stark to sort of step up and say, and say, OK, I will now marry Kat instead. Um, but Hostetelli wanted to marry off his other daughter as well and forge an alliance across the peace. And that is where John Arryn marries Lysa Tully. It's a double wedding. Um, now, it's probably worth, and we'll come back to this when we're talking about John Aaron a bit later, but it's probably worth pointing out, therefore, that this is um, a political marriage. This isn't a marriage of love. This isn't a marriage that either side particularly wanted. Um, and whereas Ned and Kat seem to have really worked at it, um, and eventually that had that turned into a really good marriage and a loving marriage, with John and Lysa all of the indications are that it just still remained a political marriage. She did not love him. Uh, she was in love with Littlefinger, as we well know. He seems not to have particularly loved her. Um, he'd had two marriages which produced no heirs. This third marriage eventually did produce an heir, but that took some time, some... Um, uh, some lost children, tragically, um, uh, pregnancies which didn't get to full term, that kind of thing. It was really quite uh, hard. And John seems to have thrown himself into his work, which was as Hand of the King. Robert Baratheon, having claimed the throne, he wanted to have his father figure there by his side ruling the kingdom. And John did, to all intents and purposes, rule the Seven Kingdoms, because Robert Baratheon, having become king, didn't really care about rulership. He didn't really care about um, anything other than him enjoying the fruits of being king. And so John Arryn, for a, a, over a day, 15 years, perhaps, he rules the Seven Kingdoms. And I'm not going to go all the way through the, the, the plot of the story after that. But as you know, what happens is that Stannis approaches him and says, I think I've discovered something very disturbing about the parentage of uh, uh, the of Joffrey and uh, Marcella and Tommen and shares it with John Arryn. The two of them start investigating. 
and then John Arryn dies. That scares Stannis. Stannis then rushes off back to Dragonstone, not to be seen of for a good year or so. And the assumption, that the reasonable assumption uh, the Starks made on the basis of what Lysa Arryn had sent them um, and what they learn is that this was the analysis. It obviously wasn't, uh, but... Uh, Lysa heads back up with her son, Rob, uh, Robert Arryn, Sweet Robin, as he's generally known, back up to the Eyrie, where she again feels impregnable. The, the, the place cannot be taken by any other. There are no more dragons anymore, so no one can take the Eyrie. Okay, so um, that is uh, the sort of rough overview of uh, House Aaron. Let's uh, have a quick flick through the chat. I think I had a, a few questions. Uh, Smurfies just saying, huzzah, new stream. Hi, everyone. Hi to you. Uh, Mara Lee, um, great to see you. Oh, fantastic um, to see you. Thank you. Very generous as well, as always, saying, hi, I have... Two questions. I'm curious about the house sigil as well as the house motto, and if they have a Valyrian steel sword. What do you think will be the eventual fate of Sweet or Robin? Um, uh, thank you. You are the best. Well, thank you very much. Um, okay, so in terms of the uh, the house sigil, uh, then you're looking at um, the a falcon. Uh, this is in keeping with the the eerie. Um, and uh, all of that imagery. So it's a it's a blue falcon uh, soaring upwards against. There's a white moon in the background uh, with a kind of a blue um, uh, sort of background uh, to that. Um, so that's the uh, the sigil. It's I mean uh, I, I think we we could. Try and sort of uh, speculate on it, what the deeper meanings might be of it. But I think this is probably just one of those things that it's just uh, th this is what they uh, identify with in the same kind of way that the Stark sigil is the, the dire wolf. This is what the House Arryn uh, they identify with. The, the falcon um, at the top of the the giant's lance at the Eyrie, you can look out and you can see the great birds of prey. Um, uh, you can look down on them sometimes as well. Uh, when we have the, the Sansa chapters, we get some wonderful um, imagery from George R. R. Martin of that. And you do feel as if you're up there amongst all the birds. And so that's the, uh, I think that's where it is. In terms of Valyrian steel sword, no, we don't have a record of that. Um, um, the eventual fate of Sweet Robin. Well, I will answer that one in full detail later when I've got a few more questions on that, if that's okay. So I'll wrap this one up with that. Uh, suffice to say that um, this is all a part of Littlefinger's plan. At the moment, the action in the Vale is, and has been for about the last book, is being pushed by Littlefinger. And he does not want Sweet Robin to be ruling. Um, that's not part of his plan. Uh, so um, if Littlefinger remains in control, I think that his eventual fate is probably not a promising one. Uh, let's go to a question from... Uh, Martin S. Hi there, Martin, saying, how many horsemen did House Arryn have in their forces in the Song of Ice and Fire era? Did they have foot soldiers too? Uh, the show is not too detailed. No, I mean, it's uh, the, the the TV show is, isn't too detailed. Um, in terms of the size of the army that they can muster, uh, the, we don't get full numbers, but we're told that, br very broadly speaking, it's probably the second largest. The, the Reach has the largest army. Uh, the Vale has potentially the second largest army. The, uh, the figures which are bandied around are 50,000. Um, that's not just 50,000 knights on horseback. That's the size of the army as a whole. However, the Knights of the Vale are renowned. Um, 
if they were to go into battle in less than the 50,000 is probably a maximum number if they were to go into battle then perhaps 20,000 uh, is another number that's sort of been bandied around um the the key thing about the knights of the veil vale, i think i have got some questions about this one as well later but uh, the key thing i think to note here is that uh, what size uh, army they have right now is actually not the only most important point in terms of thinking what their relative military strength is because almost all of the rest of the Seven Kingdoms has been involved in war now for a couple of years. And their forces have been um, largely decimated in, in one way or another. Um, you look, Stannis's forces took a huge beating at the Battle of the Blackwater. Um, you you go and have a look at the, the Riverlands, which, as always, the fighting in the Riverlands has just been destroy, destroying um, the, the whole region. Uh, Rob's army is much smaller because um, uh, it got Rob's part, the Rob Loyalist part, got destroyed completely by the Red Wedding. Um, uh, so the northern armies are much smaller than they otherwise would be. The Lannisters lost an entire army over in the Westlands when Rob took them out. Uh, so basically what you're looking at is the largest army that has not yet seen battle. Um, the, the Dornish have been uh, holding back as well, but the Dornish... Um, their army, we're basically told, is not as big as they like to pretend it is. Uh, so the the Knights of the Vale are a significant fighting force, uh, not just because there's quite a few of them, um, but also because they have not, they've been holding back from the war so far. Oh, username redacted, actually sort of following on from this, saying, are the Knights of the Vale overrated? Repelling the mountain clansmen can't require much martial prowess. Surely Stormland Knights facing Dornish incursions should have a better reputation. Yes, yeah, so the, are, the, are the Knights of the Vale overrated? I mean, it's hard to say because we've not really seen them in much combat. But they are... They're a different type of... Um, army to uh, what you have in the Stormlands. So in the Stormlands, and also across in the Reach, you get the Marcher Lords. Uh, the Marcher Lords are basically the, the Lords of the Lands around Dawn. Obviously now Dawn, everyone was all friendly for a while after they came into the Seven Kingdoms, but for centuries, millennia even, there was ongoing battles between the Dornish and the uh, the the lands and the lords uh, that bordered on to dawn, and so you get a lot of houses that have built up this reputation of being incredibly strong mil militarily. Um, so uh, House Tarly is a is a good example. House Caron as well. Um, a lot of the the houses around. Um, uh, sort of the southern parts, particularly of the Stormlands, uh, have got a really strong reputation for this kind of thing. Uh, so, yes, that's it. But this is a different type of strength to what we have with the Knights of the Vale. Now, the Andal, going way back to where we started this, the Andal invasion of Westeros started in the Vale. That's where it started. So the Andal traditions took root first in the Vale. Now, one of the key Andal traditions is that of knighthood. Knighthood is something which came from Essos. This wasn't something that the first men do. This is why in the north there are a lot fewer people who are sir, someone or other, because knighthood isn't really a first men thing. Knighthood is, knighthood is a, uh, this is an Andal thing. And chivalry and the shining armor and jousting and all of that stuff, that's an Andal thing. And that is what we have in the Vale. Now, the Reach uh, took that, and the Reach is now probably the real home of chivalry and knights and armor and things like this. this is where you get people like Loras with their beautiful armor and their jousting and their offering sweet roses to, to ladies and return for a favor all of that kind of business that's the reach specializes in that however 
The Vale consider themselves, rightly, as being sort of the first home of Andal culture in the Seven Kingdoms. There is a bit of a hint, it has to be said, that... Um, I, I don't know whether overrated is the right way of saying it, but certainly when you get those chapters, the couple of chapters through Tyrion's perspective, through Kat's perspective, when we get to the Eyrie and uh, you see the court that we've got there, Lysa Arryn and all of these knights around her, a lot of them, the, they seem to be knightly knights rather than battle-hardened knights. This is how and why Bronn put himself forward, because he could see the person he was up against and thought, I can take him, um, because Bronn is, is battle-hardened. He understands the art of fighting as opposed just to the art of tourneys. So there is a hint. This doesn't go across the whole piece. There are certainly some clear examples like Lynn Corbray we were talking about last time, clearly quite a, a, a vicious and very skilled fighter. But there, there are definitely some parts of the Vale Knights who are more about the image than they are the practicality. Um, but there are a lot of them. <laughs> so um, they're definitely still a sort of a, a force to be um, taken very seriously. Uh, let's go to um, uh, Commander Ray. Oh, this is a channel membership. You get when you're a channel member, incidentally, you get uh, free super chats um, saying thanks for the great streams and videos as always. Thank you very much. Um, you, I think you get them every this is a being a member for four months so uh, thank you very much um super chats and things to be honest if it's if it's highlighted that makes it a lot easier they get a lot of messages go through um uh, during streams so it's just a lot easier for me to see um so let's go to a question from uh my patrons um Raven's Oath. Uh, Artis Arryn, the Winged Knight versus the Griffin King. What do we know about the war between these two? I feel like we never received much information about either. Okay, this, I, I mean, I love talking about this because this is one of those things that George R. R. Martin, I think, does so well, which is he creates these legends. We often... Um, uh, when we get legends of, say, the North we often want to just believe them completely. This is exactly what the tales of the, the, uh, the long night, um, uh, the, the, the legends, the stories of what happened. Then we, we say, we want to believe them completely because there clearly is some truth there at the very least. And, uh, George R. R. Martin cautions us that legends from thousands of years ago are, legends and they should be treated in the same way that le uh, legends in our world from thousands of years ago are treated is that there's probably some truth there but the details are probably mixed up a bit uh maybe timelines maybe who was involved maybe motivations these things get lost over time and in the veil he gives us this very specific example um where we have this legend of the winged knight versus the griffin king. Now, the maesters tell us that this is a legend from before the time of the Andals. Um, you get the uh, the winged knight. This it, it takes place at the, on the giant's lance. Uh, the winged knight is sort of who uh, allegedly he could uh, he flew on falcons. Um, he could control birds. Um, uh, the Griffin King here is sort of, sort of the bad guy, um, uh, but we get links across to the children of the forest, marriage to, to the one of the children, um, and they have a battle, and the Winged Knight wins, and the first men can take control, and this is a, a legend from way back. However, um, the modern tales that are there... The Winged Knight is 
Artis Arryn, that first, if you remember the, the first king uh, of the mountains and the vale, um, the one that won the battle against the first men, that is the person who is now identified as being the winged knight. And the very clear implication is that what happened was that the um, singers, troubadours, wrote songs in order to try and curry the favour of the new lords of the realm, the new kings. Uh, they, they took an old legend and they kind of tweaked it, rewrote it uh, to put the Arins in the place of the heroes. And that that now is what the the legend is about. And in fact, you get um, this gets mentioned a few times um, in the chapters, the Sansa chapters, we have uh, Robin Arryn, sweet Robin, seems to love these stories. Um, he demands that Sansa tell him stories about the Winged Knight. Um, and actually, this is the um, the inspiration for her. If you remember the, uh, that she comes up with this idea, puts it to Littlefinger, and Littlefinger says, great, fantastic idea, of having this um, order of the Winged Knights, uh, this sort of near equivalent sort of like a, an echo of the king's guard kind of idea of having these elite knights who would be guarding um the robin Aaron, sweet robin uh the lord of the vale and so they have a tourney they've arranged a tourney to select who these winged knights should be and sansa comes up with this idea because she realizes that robin Aaron, who's scared of a lot of things one of the things that brings him comfort is this idea that uh, winged knights might protect him. So um, the the whole concept of what this conflict was, this legend uh, was, has been shifted from what was originally a first men legend of how they took the veil and turned into one how, how the Andals took the veil. The Griffin King, in their bit of the story, is as the first men. Uh, and the Winged Knight, their uh, courageous artist Aaron, their first uh, Andal King. And this is George R. R. Martin, I think, just giving us a hint as to how, in his mind, legends can be shifted and changed according to the political needs of people at different times. And I I would suggest that perhaps we should then start thinking about, are there any other legends out there that have perhaps been tweaked and changed a little bit? Um, can we actually take these thousands and thousands of years old stories at face value? Probably not. Uh, John... Buxton, a channel member for three months, saying shout out to Robert and all my esteemed home slices in the chat. Uh, thank you very much. I hugely appreciate it. Um, uh, let's go to a um, question from Jay. Uh, what is Jane Arryn's familiar, familial relationship to Roderick Arryn? Um, okay, so this is Jane Arryn, who is the she's the Lady of the Vale during the Dance of the Dragon. So we're going to see her in House of the Dragon. They have, as I said, they apparently they've cast her. So we'll see her presumably, probably only briefly. It's worth saying actually. Uh, I, I mentioned the you know, Jace doing the visit um, and her her reason for supporting Rhaenyra. Um, it's probably worth just pointing out that uh, Jane Aaron said, yes, of course, we'll support Rhaenyra uh, in exchange for dragons defending the um, the Vale. And then Rhaenyra sent um, her, her youngest son by her first husband, Joffrey, over to the Vale for safekeeping, uh, as well as uh, Rhaena uh, Velaryon. Um, uh, who was one of the twins from Damon's first marriage? So the veil actually turns into a kind of a uh, a safe harbor away from Dragonstone. If the Greens are going to be attacking anywhere to be getting at Rainier, they're going to be attacking Dragonstone. So the veil 
feels like a lot of a, a safer place for some of the younger members of uh, Team Black. Anyway, so Jane Arryn, what's her relationship to Roderick Arryn? So Roderick Arryn is the person who, um, uh, way back in the time of Jaehaerys, he marries Daella Targaryen. Now, um, she was, um, I mean, she's described in a quite similar way, it has to be said, in the books uh, to Helena Targaryen, who we will know from House of the Dragon. Uh, not so much in the way that House of the Dragon have used Helena very much in the Dragon Dreamer kind of idea, but they... They use words like simple um, and the hints that she's not very clever. With with Daella, then there um, there's mentions that she she can read, but not very fast. Um, and she seems to get quite scared of a lot of different things. And she seems to have very simple way of understanding, a straightforward understanding of the world. Um, this is all given to us via the maesters who obviously um have their own agendas um but uh, Dela was supposed to be pardon me she was supposed to be um married to one of her brothers um whose name escapes me begins with a v i'm sure somebody in the chat will pick it up in a moment um uh, but that didn't work out they just did not like each other and uh, so she basically gets, and the, at the time, uh, the uh, Jaehaerys and Alison, they had a lot of children, and they were just trying to find people for them to marry. Um, and eventually, uh, we get to the point where nothing was worse. She did not like any of these people who was being put in front of her. A lot of them decided that they didn't want her. Um, and eventually, Jaehaerys says, right, we need to, we're going to, Alison, get her married within the year. Before the year is gone, just marry her off to somebody, or else I'll I'll send her off to become a silent sister. She can't even become a scepter because she's not that good at reading. Um, so I'll send her off to be a silent sister. So uh, Alison basically scrabbles around and then finds um, Roderick Allen and marries off uh, Adela to him. Um, she, Adela we're told decided on him because of the various options she was given he seemed kind uh which is i suppose a nice thing um but uh that a bit of a digression from from that came uh emma arin who then married back into the targaryens because but married viserys but this roderick arin who married um uh, daella targaryen that was his second marriage. His first marriage, we don't know who his first marriage was to. George Martin doesn't tell us everything. Um, but his first marriage, um, he did have some children, I think four children from. And um, when we're not told exactly, George Martin hasn't given us this bit of the family tree, but the implication is that she is... Uh, that Jane Arryn is Roderick Arryn's granddaughter uh, through his eldest son. So that's that's the kind of the implication we've got there. Um, George Martin does love his family trees, but sometimes he misses out little details. We have to just kind of join up the dots that maybe there was another generation in there, but probably not. Um Caius Ballerina, uh, do you buy the theory that the giant falcon was actually a dragon? One of the pre-Valyrian dragon riders could have flown up to the Eyrie like Visenya. It's possible. This is, again, this is mentioned in a kind of a... Uh, the maesters trying to rationalise stuff, which is it's quite interesting that they're trying to rationalise stuff by saying, well, that's actually, it's not a bird, that's a dragon. Uh, but uh, the, the maesters worldview is very clear and strong that the dragons did used to exist the dragons did used to fly sometimes over to westeros and um they claimed that the wing knight who would fly on a falcon uh perhaps he was flying on a dragon 
I, I think the only possible answer we can do to this is perhaps. Um, where does this originally come from? This idea, uh, it, maybe this comes. If this is the, if this was a first man that this comes from, maybe this is somebody who is walking. Is is another option? Maybe walking into a falcon. Uh, maybe that's where all of this starts. Um, uh, a dragon is another possibility. If if I if I had to guess, I would probably say that the first men walking thing seems more likely to me. Uh, but yeah, if, if you want to think it's a if it is a dragon, then I, I I don't think there's any evidence to say that it definitely isn't. Um, right, I think that's me caught up in the chat. Uh, T Nickel just saying, uh, appreciating the live stream. So, well, thank you very much, I appreciate it. Um, let's go to Erasler, kind of following up on this Jane Aaron. So, we're back in the Dance of the Dragon still. Um, uh, Jane Aaron question, uh, despite Jane Aaron pledging to the blacks early on in the war. Uh, they don't really do anything till most of the fighting is done. Why did Jane Aaron wait so long to send her forces? Um, well, it, it's a good question, and we're not told exactly, but we have a few little hints here and there. Uh, the first one is that it's not that there were no Vale men out there in the war. We're told some of them did go to um, rally to Damon when he went to Harrenhal. Um, certainly uh when Rhaenyra holds King's Landing, then we get mention of at least one voice there. Uh, so there are some Vale men there. Um, I think it's fair to say, though, that yes, there wasn't the a big Vale army which came out. Um, now, the, eventually there was an army which landed after, pretty much uh, after Rhaenyra... Um, had been deposed and being killed, uh, then they rallied the the Arons, but said, "What? Well, we're not going to let them get away with it." This, um, and that's at the at the point at which suddenly you get this kind of uh, trifecta of Rhaenyra loyalists all arrived near King's Landing right at the very end of the uh, the war. You got the uh, the Vale troops uh who actually landed i think it was a maiden pool they landed just a bit north of of king's landing uh plus you get the lads uh the riverlands army the tullies uh sort of finally having uh, sort of come out to war and also craig and stark and his northern uh warriors coming down the king's road from the north so they all arrived at around the same sort of time um, but I think the short answer is why was there not a big Vale army involved earlier on? Is that I th I think they weren't asked. Um, it is probably it, it sounds a bit lame, but I think that's it. The 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 attack plan for the team Black it wasn't that, or, or the the way that they wanted to win the war it wasn't that based on armies on the ground if you think about their tactics and strategies um yes obviously they got involved in a few battles on the ground but when spoilers for house of the dragon obviously here the in, in case you're new to this channel the rule on this channel is that book spoilers are absolutely fine the books have been out for a while uh, tv show spoilers are not okay i don't look for tv show spoilers so i'm not sharing any tv show spoilers i know no tv show spoilers honestly um uh, but uh if i'm saying what happens in the books there's a fair chance that something very similar is going to happen on the show so um that said um the team black strategy yes they they wanted boots on the ground but it was more about the dragons uh when Rhaenyra took um, King's Landing, it was about the Dragon's Landing. There was some troop support as well, but it was mostly about the Dragon's Landing and them coming in and taking King's Landing that way. Uh, you had Daemon on Caraxes uh, in the Riverlands. That's their main uh, force going on there. When they had to deal with the, uh, the Hightower army coming up from the 
from Old Town from the southwest. Um, they dispatched a few of the dragon seeds off there to deal with them. It was their main focus was about the dragons. So actually, they knew what we know. If we take a step back and think about it, the 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 way to win the dance of the dragons is to have the the, the your dragons winning. You have uh, a dragon advantage over your opponent. Um, one grown dragon can take out an army just like that. Uh, so there wasn't an urgent need for a Veil vale army, uh, and I don't think they were asked for it. Added to which, uh, Rhaenyra seemed to be treating it as a place that they could put some of their the younger family members in uh, where they're protected. Uh, also some dragon eggs, the three dragon eggs were sent over there as well. So uh, that seems to be where, what they wanted the veil for, um, not their army. Um, Andrew Kay saying dragons are always the most influential in these conflicts. Aegon the first and his sister wives uh, forces were all forces were almost an afterthought as well. Yeah, agree. So, I mean, this is, this is how you win in, in a, a drag dragon based society like that. This is how you win. Um, let's go to a question from the King's Road saying, G'day, Robert. G'day to you. Uh, in the books, as in the TV show, Sweet Robin, so we're now moving up to Song of Ice and Fire time, Sweet Robin couldn't have been less like his father, John Arryn. What do we know of John Arryn's relationship with his son? Uh, we know he meant to have him fostered elsewhere, but are there any other interesting points? Well, we don't get told huge amounts about that relationship, it has to be said. It, it happened before the main events of the show, um, and we we never meet John Aaron. He's dead before before the, the action starts. So um, we have to kind of read between the lines a little bit. Where when I was giving the overview, where, where I started, which I think is the right place to start, is that this was a political marriage with Lysa. And it was a troubled marriage as well. Um, they both did their duty, so to speak. Uh, but uh, there were disagreements and disputes between them. Uh, when we saw Lysa, um, she seemed to be... Um, oh my insert your own appropriate words there, but um, quite sort of gregarious and high strung, um, uh, which seemed quite at odds with what we seem to know about John Arryn. So there probably was a bit of a personality clash. Uh, they lost a few, um, there was a lot of failed pregnancies, they lost a few uh, potential children, but then they did finally get this one child, uh, Robin Arryn. When he arrived, John Arryn had a one of, if not the busiest and hardest jobs in the entire Seven Kingdoms. He was Hand of the King to a king who didn't care about ruling himself, who didn't want to get involved in any of the day-to-day -day running of the Seven Kingdoms, and yet wanted a ridiculously lavish lifestyle. Um, this was hard work. So I think it's probably fair to say that John Arryn did not see huge we, we never hear oh when he doted on his son or anything like that so there probably wasn't huge amounts of time there and the the, the clue we have is that john Arryn apparently had been planning to send uh, sweet robin to be fostered with stannis baratheon now <laughs> John Aaron knew what Stannis was like, um, and you and he obviously knew what his son was like. And you have to interpret this as him thinking that his son needed to have a firmer hand uh, to be guiding him as he grew up. Which seems to imply that um I don't know whether he was a disappointment to, to John Aaron, um, but uh, John Aaron felt that um, 
Lysa perhaps was Molly coddling him too much, something along those lines. Um, so when you say, to return to the beginning bit of what you say, that Sweet Robin couldn't have been less like his father, um, we never saw John Aaron, so we don't know exactly what he's like. Um, I assume you mean in character. Uh, so Sweet Robin is still young. He is still a child, let's not forget. Um, and who knows what would have happened if he'd been if he had ended up with someone like Stannis bringing him up maybe he would have become more like his father um Chaos Ballerina um John wanted to foster sweet Robin at Fortified Dragonstone with the only other person who knew of the paternity problem. And the last thing he did was to commission a suit of armor. Was he moving to go to war? Um, I mean, it's a good question. Um, the, the, the fact I th think is if you're looking at um Stannis first, because we know what Stannis was thinking around this time. We don't know everything that John Aaron was thinking around this time. Um, I've got a video, and the reason I'm I've been thinking about this, I've got a video coming out some point. Can't remember in a week or two's time. Um, called "Could Stannis Have Won," which is something that's sort of been nagging at the back of my brain for a long time. Could Stannis at the Battle of the Blackwater? Was there a way that he could have shifted things around? Was there something he could have done to actually win that battle and actually claim the Iron Throne? Um, so I'm working through that. And as part of that, I, I did go through what his thinking was. And in particular, there's this gap. There's this long gap of a year or so um, after he thinks he knows what's going on uh, with Twin Cest. Um, and he leaves and he goes back to Dragonstone and then nothing. This is a, this is a point of um, much conversation when you read the first book. Uh, what's, what's Stannis up to? Where he, He's gone back. We've not heard anything from him. And he didn't, he didn't declare himself. He didn't say, I am, I'm the king. He didn't say, uh, Joff Joffrey's illegitimate, Joffrey's a bastard, um, he's not Robert Baratheon's son. He didn't say any of these things until much later, until um, we've already got, until Rob Stark has been made King of the North, King in the North, uh, until his own brother Renly had declared himself king. By this point, Stannis's hand was largely forced and he did have send out that letter. But we get Davos talking to Stannis, and Stannis is very open and honest with Davos. Davos is very open and honest with Stannis. And basically they they say Stannis didn't think he had enough proof. He, he, he didn't think that he had the proof that he could show anyone to say, this is definitely the case, therefore I should be king, therefore I'm going to take the throne by force. That's what the delay was. He just didn't think he had the proof for it. And though we don't get inside John Aaron's mind, we don't know what he was thinking, but the, the clear implication, given that the two of them were working together on this, John Aaron, although, yes, he says the seed is strong, these are his dying words, um, he, he never seems to have actually come out. That seems to be like a clue to someone. When you think about it, the seed is strong. It's just really quiet. It is quite vague. Ned thinks, what does that mean? The seed is strong. Um, it's almost as if uh, John Aaron was there thinking, I, I don't have enough yet to say, even on my deathbed, for sure that that's, this is the case. Um, but I want to give people clues so that they can carry on what I started doing with the investigation. So uh, if you take all of that and then you kind of wind it back to where we were, were with the question, was he preparing to go to war? Um, 
I, th- I think that the, the two things is sort of the ordering the armor um, and the uh, sending his son to Stannis to be fostered. Both of them have reasonable other explanations. Uh, the, we've already covered the why he might send Sweet Robin over to Stannis. Actually, from his perspective, probably made reasonable sense. Um, the going to order set of armor we've got a reasonable explanation. This was an excuse to go and uh, take a look at Gendry when he's trying to understand you know, Gendry, of course, being Robert Baratheon's uh, bastard son. Um, and he was just wanting to look and say, okay, so that's what this bastard son looks like. Uh, surely his children by Cersei should look a bit like that. So that was an excuse. So we have got reasons for those things. Um, uh, John Aaron probably in the back of his mind thought, well, he will have known that if he went public, it would be war. So there's no hint that he'd sort of sent back to the Vale to say, hey guys, can you just start um, start getting ready? Um, in the way that, incidentally, Ned does, when he gets the... When he heads south... Um, it's an easily overlooked factor, but it's, it shows actually a, quite a lot of Ned's character. Um, he, when Ned heads south, he thinks this is going to end in war. He thinks that so there's a fair to middling chance this is going to end in war, and he actually sends off a few messages. He sends a, he, he sends a message over to the Mandalese and says, uh, "Look, just you know, just on the quiet. Just can you get the sea defenses up? Can you start building up your navy?" Um, he sends a message to um, Howland Reed. Says, "Just you know, just be aware. Yes, you, you're controlling the neck. Just war might be coming. Be ready." We don't get those kind of messages coming through from the Vales if that's what John Aaron was doing. So I think he expected it at some point if he went public, but he wasn't yet ready to go public. Um. John Buxton uh, saying, evening, Robert. Evening to you too, sir. Do you think we might see anything from John Aaron in the Tourney at Harrenhal play? Thanks, mate. Oh, so Tourney at Harrenhal play, for those who do not know, but this is probably the um, Game of thrones verse. is that a thing? Um, uh, uh, Spin-off that I am most excited about. Um, this is a stage play that is uh the george martin is i mean i don't know whether he's credited as co-writer but he has been actively involved in about the turning at harren hall and uh its current working title is the iron throne and uh, when he last mentioned it which was towards the end of last year he came over to london for two and a half weeks and he met a whole load of people and he visited the House of the Dragon studios, all of those good things. But he also said that he'd been talking to the writers, producers of this. And although he didn't wish to tempt fate, he was hoping perhaps towards the end of 2024, it might be on the stage, which seems to imply that the, the script must be quite advanced. Um. We know no more, other than the fact that they're currently thinking of calling it the Iron Throne, which seems to imply that this is going to be focusing more on the sort of the political side, the sort of the Rhaegar and Aerys kind of side um, than anything else. Um, might we see anything from um, John Arryn there? Um, off the top of my head, I don't think he was there. Um, I think he was still um, in the in the Vale. Obviously, though, his two foster children, uh, Ned and um, Robert Baratheon, were there. Um, and so we'll we'll definitely get a, um, a sort of, we'll see his influence. Uh, but he doesn't, uh, even if he was there, um, he doesn't play a particular role. So um, might we see him? Um, possibly, possibly not. Is he going to play a central role? Probably not. Um, 
Uh, but I, that doesn't, in for one second, stop me being hugely excited about this. Um, the Kais Ballerina saying, "Who do you want to rule, Robin, Harry, or Timmit? Uh, Timmit, some of Timmit, obviously." Um, uh, I mean, I don't know about who who I want to rule. Harry, Harry, Harry Harding, Harry the heir. Um, he's the next in line. So, um, John Aaron, it has to be said, he, he's had, he had quite a, a hard few years in terms of his family members dying. Um, he obviously, he has that one son and heir. Um, but, uh, after that, then he did. He had a younger brother who died. His younger brother had a son who died. Um, then uh, we had. He also had a sister um, who also died, and then she had uh, something, uh, something like seven daughters and one son. And the son died, um, and then uh, a few of these other daughters also died uh, it, it's really quite and, and looking through it it's really quite i mean if if it were the targaryens i'd call it quite suspicious but we don't know enough about the you know, the context of all of this um but harry uh, harry harding is uh he is the next in line after robin aaron uh, after sweet robin uh and and he's a long way off um, down the family tree, um, and we meet him in the uh, the pre-release chapter from the Winds of Winter, the Sansa chapter, um, Elaine, and he he doesn't come across very well. It has to be said, he comes across as being a little bit um, condescending, a little bit full of himself. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not a hundred percent sold on that. Um, but probably he's probably better than Littlefinger. Um, right. So um, actually, just as as I try to do at some point partway through my streams, anyway, I'm just going to take this as a moment to say, moderators, you're doing a fantastic job as always. If you are, if you're in the chat, um, I can see. I mean, I've got several wonderful moderators, but I can see in the chat right now, uh, Stephanie Frederick, Carl Karlsnark, and Andrew K. Just giving them shouts out. Um, uh, there may well be other moderators in there too. I just can't see your names immediately, um, but uh, they do a fantastic job um, keeping the the conversation going and keeping it safe in case anybody comes in. Uh, we occasionally get these kind of spam bots coming in uh, and the like, and I'm sure we will when uh, House of Dragon comes on, but they do an amazing job. Uh, so if you are there in the chat, then uh, please do just uh, give them a little bit of love. Um, and uh, I also want to give a little bit of love to my patrons. Thank you, patrons. If you do want to support this channel, that's the best way to do it through Patreon. Um, that's why I try and answer my patrons questions all the time on these live streams because that i can't do this without their support so thank you very much um let's go to a question from rasla was john aaron an effective hand of the king uh he made some great decisions at the beginning oversaw 15 years of relative peace but also allowed robert to bankrupt the realm and allowed lannister power to grow unchecked uh, where would you rank him in effective hands of the kings? Gina Z or Gina Z, perhaps saying hi, Robert. Um, thank you for covering House Aaron. Um, his death is mainly what we remember about him, but I'm interested about his how effective he was as hand of the king. What do we know about his accomplishments? Um, I think I probably had another couple of people asking the same. Um, how effective was was he a good hand of the king? Um, uh, Stephanie Frederick, actually, just in the chat, I just spotted you saying Broadway or London uh, West End. Um, Giorgio Martin has he he has said both at various times, but his most recent one talked about London and the West End. Um, I mean, the dream would be opening both at the same time. Uh, from a purely selfish perspective, I hope it opens in London. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, it's. Uh, it will definitely, I would have thought, if it's a success, 
whichever side of the Atlantic the first uh, production is on, then it will move over to the other side of the Atlantic quite quickly. But anyway, sorry, uh, that was a digression. Was John Arryn a good Hand of the King? Now, this is a fantastic, I think it's a fantastic question. Um, because we're told various people sort of say, yeah, he was, he was good, he was competent, um, and then a lot of other people have sort of come in and said, well, but if you look at it, um, it all did, you know, he, he didn't really manage things all that well. Um, so let's, let's look at what he did and let's look at how effective that was, if there's any mitigating circumstances, and try and come to some kind of overall opinion on whether or not he was a good hand of the king. So when he came in, I think this is probably the 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 biggest and best thing you can say about him. He came in to a divided kingdom uh, that had been at war with itself, not just like these, uh, you know, the north and the Vale of Arran and the Riverlands were against these bits of the. It wasn't just that clear cut, even within each of the different realms. I mean, the north perhaps was the most united, but even within the Vale, uh, there were several people, there were several um, uh, lords who decided to support the king rather than uh, the John Arryn, their lord. Um, everybody had this choice between uh, if. if the Lord Paramount in their region decided to be on Robert's side, then that everyone had that choice. Should we go with what our Lord Paramount does and that vow that we made, or should we go with our king and that vow that we've made? So everybody had this kind of weighing up to do. Even, uh, interestingly, even Stannis, this is, again, this is, I've been looking a lot at Stannis. Um, this is a, a fascinating, when he talk again, he talks to, I think this must be to Davos about this as well, and he's just f fiercely honest, and he sort of says, that was a decision. We always kind of assume, you know, of course he's he stood with his brother, but he's there. He, Stannis is all about the duty, but and it's just like, that was, that was a decision that I had to make, because, you know, my duties to my king, uh, but then my brother is rebelling. And basically, he kind of admits that this that time he went with family rather than duty, which places him in this kind of very much kind of Ned Starky kind of situation as well, which is interesting echoes going across there. But even Stannis was weighing up which way do you go. And so uh, John Arryn came in to a divided Seven Kingdoms. And he managed to unify it, broadly speaking. Um, now, how he did that was he decided he had to have the Lannisters on board. The Lannisters, hugely powerful. Uh, he had to get them aboard. He met, he got, met, it was he who basically organized the, uh, the marriage between Cersei and Robert Baratheon. Now, obviously, Tywin was wanting this as well. It wasn't just John Arryn, but... John Arryn was the person that Robert Baratheon trusted. And you have to remember, at this point, Robert Baratheon is in mourning for the person that he thought he was going to be marrying, the person that he was, he loved, the person that he had, uh, in his mind, started an entire civil war for, Lyanna Stark. Now, obviously, none of that was reciprocated on her part, but from Robert's perspective, he, he just ripped the continent in half for this woman who is now dead, and now he's being told he has to marry somebody else. John Arryn did the persuading and the bargaining that made that happen, and also tried to work out what what do we need to in order to get the um, the Lannisters in on this and actually bought in. Um, he incidentally. He had he was on the opposite side of the debate to to Ned about what to do with Jamie Lannister. Ned wanted Jamie to be sent up to the wall. He just he just uh, broken his vows to protect the king. Uh, he should be going up to the wall. Uh, but uh, John Arryn persuaded Robert. Actually, this will just annoy the Lannisters. Annoy Tywin, um, and secondly, and probably most importantly, what he 
also did was he uh, launched a peace mission to Dawn. The Dornish, the Martells, were up in arms about what had happened. Um, Elia had been Rhaegar's wife. She'd been brutally murdered. Her children had been brutally murdered. Lewin Martell was a member of the, uh, the Kingsguard. He'd been killed in the line of duty. Uh, we read later, Oberyn Martell, the Red Viper, he was he was going around Dawn actively trying to gather together an army to take the battle against the Lannisters. There was going to be an extra bit of war happening. And John Arryn talked to Doran Martell and managed to broker peace. And that actually was a significant achievement on his part. And so that's the first thing and for broadly speaking the the seven kingdoms came back together there was one bit of not peace during that time which was the greyjoy rebellion that was dealt with relatively swiftly it has to be said um then you sort of balance this against and and so sort of prosperity and peace happened across the seven kingdoms you balance this against uh, the fact that the, the Iron Throne was going deeper and deeper in debt in his time. Now, is that something he could have done something about? Well, perhaps not. This was all Robert Baratheon cared about. He wanted to do a big tourney. He would say, I need the money. Littlefinger would say, well, I can find the money. And things just kept on moving. Could John Aaron have been tougher on that? Perhaps uh, but at the same time, there were mitigating circumstances. Um, he did allow the Lannisters to get quite a firm grip on the centre of power in King's Landing, but perhaps he didn't see it that way, um, whether you would agree with this or not, but the, the small council was not Lannister majority by any stretch of the imagination. It had um, Sir Barristan on it, who was not a Lannister loyalist. It had Littlefinger, who was not a Lannister loyalist. It had Varys, who was not a Lannister loyalist. It had John Arryn himself on it, who was not a Lannister loyalist. So th this was, although from looking back, the, the Lannisters had managed to grab a whole load of power in King's Landing, a lot of that happened a lot of that extra power grab happened after john aaron had died um so uh, where do we if we sort of try and balance all of these different things where do we rate him do we think well put, put in the chat if, it's, if if you're watching this live do pop in the chat how good uh, uh a hand of the king do you think he is or if actually if you're watching this later i try and do this every now um i'm very aware that maybe 90% of the people who watch these live streams don't watch them live. Uh, if that's you, if you're watching this back, back later, hi, uh, I, I see you. Thank you so much. Uh, feel free to pop in the comments as well. I'll, I'll read all the comments. Um, uh, do you think he was a good hand of the king? Um, on balance, my take is that uh, he was an okay to competent hand of the king with a very uh, bad king in terms of... Uh, being helpful to him being able to run the kingdom competently uh what i mean by that is if you look at the the hands of the king that we rate as being good uh they would include people like septon bath who worked with jaharis who took an active involvement in running the seven kingdoms uh who came up with ideas about uh, what should be done. Um, Alison was also actively inv involved in trying to bring the Seven Kingdoms together with marriages and things like that. Uh, law changes as well, she was behind. So Septon Bath, yeah, great hand of the king, but he had uh, a king and queen partnership who were working very strongly and closely with him. Similarly, we get people at Otto Hightower is generally viewed as being very competent at what he did. If you forget the stuff that happened with the Dance of the Dragons, uh, actually running the Seven Kingdoms for Viserys, he seems to have done very well. But that's with Viserys, who um, was uh, 
quite a genial guy um, and kind of let him get on with it. But he spent a bit, but not anywhere near as much as Robert Baratheon. Um, so if you compare them if, to other Hands of the King, I, I think John Arryn, he has to be better than some of the some of the ones that Aerys had in the later part of his um uh, reign and rule. Um, you compare him to Ned Stark. Ned Stark made a number of very good and wise decisions, but we all know that in that situation, Ned Stark was never going to last very long. John Aaron did last long. So uh, I, I don't think we can say he was a great Hand of the King. Um, I don't think we can say he was a terrible Hand of the King. I think we have to put him somewhere in the middle. Uh, one other thing which I just before we move on from that, which I would just asterisk, is that whenever you get, particularly Ned, Robert Baratheon was the same, um, reminiscing about John Arryn, they, it's, it's rose-tinted spect spectacles time. They loved the guy. They thought he was fantastic. If you then look at what he did, he may not have been a bad guy, but it wasn't the same kind of level up there. Uh, I mean, Ned Stark's like, oh, I wonder what. I mean, Ned Stark does have a few self esteem issues. He wonders what Brand and his brother would have done. What about Ned Aaron? Um, Ned Aaron, John Aaron. Um, so uh, he's he's not as he's not as good as some people seem to think he is. Okay, let's go to. Um, the chat, I'll have a look in the chat uh, in just a second to see what people uh, think. Um, question from Sarah, awesome source, saying, haven't caught a stream in a while. Things are looking and sounding crisp. Good. I'm very pleased to hear that. Uh, my Patreon notifications reminded me to pop in and show some support. Cheers and thanks for the content. Well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'll say I'll say this again at the end of the stream. Uh, so uh, yeah, I know I've been having uh, audio problems over the last few weeks. I'm trying. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to sort my way through them. Um, next week there will not be a live stream. I know I've missed a few recently. This is the last one we're going to be missing for a very long time, probably till the end of the year, for the best of reasons because I'm actually moving house next week. Um, and I'm going to get the setup right. Uh, I'm going to put a little bit of time in making sure all of the connections are working properly. So hopefully even crisper when I'm back in two weeks' time, even crisper and looking even better. That's the hope at least. But thank you, uh, Sarah. Uh, great to see you. Uh, thank you for popping in. Um, let's go, uh, so Andrew K saying a hand can do only do so much surrounded by an apathetic king and self-serving snakes, um, rounding out the circle of power. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Luna Cascade saying, hello, joining, uh, late. So excuse, I've already asked. Did John Aaron realize how much Lysa despised him? Did he have any emotional intelligence? Um, it hasn't been. It hasn't been asked. We, we asked what we, we looked at what John's relationship was to his son, but not so much whether he knew what she felt about. I, I think he. Lysa Aaron doesn't seem the type. From what we've seen, she doesn't seem the type to be able to. Uh, whole stuff back behind a facade let's put it that way I, th I think she seems very um what she thinks and feels she she puts out there um now we do know um i probably could have tried to check this beforehand i'm trying to remember the exact source but we do know that she didn't there, there were some things about him that she didn't like i think maybe this was her talking to cat but it was just like uh she didn't like his bad breath or something like that there was there were some like really personal things and i suspect probably um uh, he will have been aware of this um we're not told we we never get a pov from him uh, so we can't ever be 100 percent sure about what kind of emotional intelligence he had uh but i think it seems pretty clear that lysa aaron is not the kind of person to hold back Um, right, uh, 
and Andrew Case saying the feeling might have been somewhat mutual. Don't think John was super happy either, especially being aware of uh, Lysa's premarital pregnancy. Uh, yes, um, uh, just a few people opining on John Aaron. Urias Tosh saying John Aaron was mid. Um, and I saw somebody else saying he was uh, 8.5. Um, um, Stephanie Frederick saying Littlefinger was playing fast and loose with the money. Uh, how do you think he got rich? Absolutely. Um, but he also was very good at hiding it. Tyrion, it, it seems that, I mean, it's a slight digression, but it, this it kind of ties into the one of the big accusations you have against John Aaron being good and competent as Hand of the King is this, and he allowed the crown to go into debt. Um, when Tyrion is made, Tyrion was Hand of the King for a period of time through Book Two, Clash of Kings. Afterwards, he then gets made Master of Coin uh, by Tywin, and he inherits the big books uh, from Littlefinger, and he spends a lot of time just going through them. And it's only when he goes through them that he realizes exactly what's been going on. Uh, he can see with the accounts, he can see the debts that have been racked up. He was unaware of that as, yes, he had other things he was caring about at the time. Uh, but he, while he was being Hand of the King, he was unaware of exactly how much debt the, uh, the Iron Throne was in. Uh, he was unaware of all of the things that Littlefinger was up to. Uh, and I think that we can, as Tyrion is clearly a clever guy, um, so I think we can assume that John Arryn also was unaware and that this is more to do with Littlefinger being clever with money. Uh, it's more to do with that than it is to do with John Arryn being good or not good at his job. Um Right, let's go to a question from Jay saying, Hey, Robert, is it common for someone in Lysa Tully's position, Lysa Aaron, to have so much power as regent? Why weren't there any Aaron challenges to Sweet Robin after John Aaron is killed? Okay, so on the second half of that one, um, why weren't there any challenges to Sweet Robin? Everybody accepted, in the veil, everybody accepted that Sweet Robin was the heir. This is John Aaron. Everybody accepted John Aaron was the their rightful lord. When he died, his son was the rightful heir. So nobody doubted that. Um, when uh, later on we do get this challenge, when Littlefinger basically launches his coup, we get the challenge led uh, by uh, Jon Royce and the Lord's Declarant. Uh, the challenge there is not uh, Robin Aaron should not be uh, the the Lord. It was we want to have him ourselves. We we don't want him here uh, under your influence. We want to be fostering him over in Runestone with the Royces. That was that was the argument. Um, so there was never any doubt in anyone's mind that Sweet Robin was the Lord. Whether or not they thought he would make a good Lord is pretty much neither here nor there. Nobody disputed the fact that he was the rightful heir. Um, as to the first part of your question, is it normal that Lysa Aaron should have so much power as regent? I mean, I think that the short answer is yes. Um, we, When you get a child, and we see this lots of different times, lots of different uh, time periods in, in uh, the history of the Seven Kingdoms, when you get a, a child as lord or king or whatever, and then a regent or some regents are put in place to be uh, ruling in their stead, and they do rule in their stead. So you get, uh, just to pick a couple of classic examples out, when you had um, Jaehaerys was, Jaehaerys the first, when he became king. Um, this was after Magor the Cruel had, uh, he died. Jaehaerys was pronounced king, but he's too young to actually rule. Um, he went off to Dragonstone with Alison. Um, and yes, he kept himself in 
engaged with what was going on, but he wasn't ruling. That was there was regent, so his his mother uh, was the regent, um, and she, along with her husband, who happened to be hand of the king, ruled. Similarly, when we get Aegon the Third after the Dance of the Dragons, Aegon the Third, there's a whole team, a squad of regents, seven of them, who ruled. And Aegon the Third, we're told during that time, didn't he didn't engage in anything really. He re rarely left his rooms, um, so uh, they were ruling in his stead. So this idea of having uh, a regent who has basically is ruling is quite well established and it's not just for the targaryens and the kings um when we were talking about jane arryn um back in the dance of the dragons when she inherited she was three and uh, so she couldn't rule then and there was a regent who ruled in her stead that was the lord royce at the time the royces as i say they keep on popping up they're hugely powerful in the vale um so I, I think the short answer is yes uh the the legal gray area is about who decides who these regents are and that is a matter of oh, pardon me great power because uh so lysa arin just kind of assumed the queen regent role now not everybody was a hundred percent happy with that. Uh, so she'd come in and just if you if you think through her history there, she'd been married to John Aaron. Not this wasn't a, it was a politically necessary marriage rather than a politically good marriage. It had become known that she had uh, been pregnant and had uh, been forced to um, uh, drink moon, moon tea. And this was, I mean, some people might see this as a bit of a shame, um, uh, a sort of a, an honour issue for John Arryn. But he went through with this political marriage and then she was not delivering him the children that for a long time that he and they wanted and she was not the most sympathetic of characters it has to be said added to which john arryn became hand of the king he and uh, lysa spent most of their time down in king's landing so they weren't in the vale all that long so she was not well loved in the Vale. It's probably fair to say yes, she's the mother of the uh, their new lord, but that doesn't mean that there are many people who owe her this great loyalty, personal loyalty. So that's the the situation um, uh, that you you've got. Uh, and who decides who is regent? Well, she decided she was regent, but it's entirely possible that what could have happened is something similar to when uh, Littlefinger effectively, when I say he launched his coup, what happens is uh, Lysa uh, is, well, he throws her out of the moon door, he frames Merillion for it, um, and takes control himself. He basically makes him, he calls himself Lord Protector, but he basically makes himself regent, at which point the Lord's declarant come together, the, the Lords of some of the most powerful houses in the Vale, they come together to object to this. So the, the real power lies in who is it who feels that they have the power to be able to decide who the regent is. As Varys says, power resides where men believe that it does. Um, Martin S. saying, how much real power did King Robert Baratheon actually have at the time John Arryn and later Eddard was hand? How much was it undermined by various factors, including his own personal limitations? Um, how much power did he have? At, well, certainly at the start of his reign, absolute power. I think is probably the the only way to say it. He, it, it's easy to just think of oh, Robert's rebellion was just this great um, 
uh, alliance of lots of different houses rising up against uh, the Mad King, and there is definitely a strong element of that. But it's hard with when we've not actually sort of seen it in a TV show or something. But it's 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 hard to conceptualize quite how much Robert himself was the figurehead of this. You get. For the vast majority of the rebellion itself, Ned is just working his way up to the north, gathering his forces and slowly bringing his forces down. The north were not involved until this war was halfway through. Similarly, the Vale were not involved uh, because John Aaron had to deal with a lot of troublesome lords in his own area. Robert Baratheon um, sing led the assault on Gulltown, who were being rebellious. Then he headed over back to the Stormlands, ra rallied his own army, faced three battles in a day, uh, of which on each of these he personally sought out the opposing lord and defeated them in a one-on-one -on -one battle. Um, worked his way around, uh, lost one battle uh, against Randall Tarly, uh, then made his way up through the Riverlands. The Battle of the Bells was a hunt for Robert Baratheon. That's what, but basically he ended up in a, uh, a random small town and was in hiding while John Connington and the Targaryen forces went house to house trying to hunt him down. Um, and then uh, Ned and uh, and the others all turned up and turned into a battle, at which point Robert Baratheon emerges once more and piles straight into the battle. When we get to the Battle of the Trident and he goes and fights Rhaegar again, one-on-one, -on -one, hunting down uh, the, the, the leader, the lord, the, the prince in this case, who is leading the army, personally taking them on with his war hammer, smashing in smashing, uh, caving in his chest. This was Robert as a figurehead. He is the most powerful person in the Seven Kings. He personally claimed the throne uh, through his own force of personality and winning battles himself as much as anything else. Um, so how much power did he have to start with? Huge amounts. To the extent to which Tywin Lannister felt that he had to order the, uh, the murder of Rhaegar's children to show his loyalty. Um, so that's where he was at the beginning. As it went on later, as, as I mean, his power was there. If he, if he decided to do something, then people would have followed because he was the king. But he just didn't care. The vast majority of the time, he just did not care. So he had the power, but he just didn't use it. Um, okay, let's go to a question from, uh, well, three, three questions, all quite, uh, related. Steelheart saying, hi, Robert, will the Vale ride to war at any point in the remaining story, or will they stay on the sidelines the entire time? Commander Ray um, saying, thanks in part to the show, we have this image of the Arryns and the rest of the Vale Knights as an idealistic heavy cavalry. But how effective will they be? And um, uh, how often did the Arryns manage to pose a threat to other kingdoms prior to Aegon's conquest? Misty, Mr. Worldwide saying, uh, we hear so much talk about their Knights of the Vale. I can't think of a time they actually displayed their prowess in modern battle. Are they really that formidable? Will we see them in action in the coming books? So let's go to, uh, we, we talked a little bit about the Knights of the Vale earlier um, and broadly came to the conclusion that, uh, yes, they're, an impressive fighting force, perhaps not the most impressive fighting force, but uh, they have the advantage of not having been involved in combat, whereas almost everyone else has. So they are going to be fresh and at full strength whenever they do enter. Um, now, will they at some point enter the fray? I think the answer has to be yes. They they haven't so far because Lysa Arryn and then Littlefinger took this on, but Lysa Arryn was adamant that they they would not. Uh, House Royce were they they were so angry. Um, Yon Royce was really angry that 
they were not coming in in support behind uh, Rob Stark because of what happened to to Ned Stark. He he was friends with the Starks. Uh, the voices of friends with the Starks. Um, and so they wanted to get involved a lot earlier. A lot of the knights, uh, when again, when you get those fantastic scenes in the Eyrie, when we see them through Cat and Tyrion's perspective, the knights of the Vale are all kind of hanging around, saying, "Well, we we could we could go to into battle now." Um, uh, and she's knows, no, no, not at all. So they're they're kind of champing at the bit. Um, the knights of the Vale, they want to be involved in combat they just haven't been told to go now the question is then if Littlefinger is as as he appears to be at the moment and will probably carry on for a while if Littlefinger is in control of the veil will he bring them into action and I, th I think I'll read I, I've read this I'm sure before but I think this is a really um key quote this this is the the last i think it's the last sense of chapter we have when um little finger is telling her his plan and his plan involves uh her um as we'll see marrying harry harding who is the heir after sweet robin and uh sansa star she says if robert sweet robin were to die and then little finger arches an eyebrow when robert dies our poor brave sweet robin is such a sickly boy it's only a matter of time when robert dies harry the heir becomes lord harold defender of the vale and lord of the eyrie john arryn's bannerman will never love me nor our silly shaking robert but they will love their young falcon and when they come together for his wedding, and you come out with your long auburn hair, clad in a maiden's cloak of white and grey, with a direwolf emblazoned on the back, why, every knight in the vale will pledge his sword to win you back your birthright. So, those are your gifts from me, my sweet Sansa, Harry, the Eyrie, and Winterfell. So, I, I, I see no reason we sh obviously shouldn't always take Littlefinger at his word, but I see no reason why we should doubt this, him telling his plan here to Sansa. And the plan, just to sort of summarise that, is that Sweet Robin is going to die, an accident, or, or he's just too sickly, get poisoned, whatever, the clear implication is Littlefinger is going to kill Sweet Robin. He That makes Harry the heir, Harry the lord. He marries Sansa, and Sansa reveals herself, because she's in disguise at the moment as, as Elaine, Littlefinger's bastard daughter. Uh, she reveals herself as Sansa Stark, and then suddenly uh, all of the Knights of the Vale are there going we're behind this new uh, power couple the 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 leaders the of uh, we for so long we we didn't have john aaron was not here because he had to be the hand of the king lysa was was not she she wasn't leading us out to to do the right thing to go to war to avenge uh, you know to to support our allies suddenly they've got harry who looks the part whether he actually is the part is a different matter he looks the part and sansa who at that moment in time probably will appear as if she's the only remaining stock um that the vale lords will including yon royce will fall in behind them and Littlefinger is going to give sansa winterfell what does give her winterfell mean i think this means that he's going to want the veil, the, the the knights of the veil to go up to the north. In his mind, they take Winterfell from the Boltons and install Sansa up in Winterfell. So that's his plan. So I think that's the answer. Obviously, on the TV show, they they did arrive um, just when we had the Battle of the Bastards. Um, we shouldn't take that as too much of a stir of exactly how they're going to arrive or what's going to happen when they arrive. But I think that is echoing what the, the fact that they do go up to the north is echoing what seems to be where the plot of the books are going. Uh, Robbie Obi. 
Why did John Aaron let things get so bad without telling anyone? Uh, my theory, um, he didn't. Uh, Littlefinger embezzled most of the crown deficit and killed John when he was discovered. The rest was just icing. Um, okay, so we picked on a few elements of this um, already, I think. So um, Littlefinger embezzling some of the crown deficit. I, I think he probably did. But at the same time, I mean, Littlefinger is hugely rich, but at the same time, um, Tyrion, when he was looking at the books, he he could see the debt. He could see Littlefinger sort of create moving money around, creating money. Da, 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 uh, thing. He, he didn't come to the conclusion that Littlefinger was literally stealing from the crown. That doesn't seem to be what was going on. Sure, he might have, like, given himself a few loans here or there that will allow him to build up his own business empire we know that he had his business empire within uh, king's landing once that was up and running he didn't need the money from uh, from the crown he had his own sources of income so um uh yeah what why um did Littlefinger just kill John when he was discovered about that? I mean, it's a nice, it's a nice theory, and it kind of. I mean, I think it's quite hard to dispute it. Um, but ultimately, I, th I think this is Littlefinger wanting to create chaos, and he because he wanted to climb because he backs himself. This is the. I mean, we all know it. This is what his modus operandi is. He creates chaos. Uh, he sees chaos as a ladder, a ladder that he can climb to greater power himself. The, the fundamental point is that he backs himself. He trusts himself to think on his feet better than anyone else and use the opportunities that that chaos will, uh, will grant him and gain more power for himself. Um, I may, may be... Uh, we get the situation where uh, John Aaron would found something about Littlefinger, but he, that wasn't the thing that was on his mind when he died. The thing that was on his mind when he died was him investigating what was happening with uh, Robert Baratheon's children or uh, the fact that they, the heir was not Robert Baratheon's child. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to say to dispute it, but the the set of events that we know about does already answer i think already answer the uh sort of the the questions that need answering um let's go so um rustler asking how harold harding and john aaron are related i think i answered that one um a while ago but i'll just sort of very quickly recap so he is the heir um harold harding um John Aaron, Lord of the Vale, he has one son only, three marriages, one son only, who is Sweet Robin. Um, Sweet Robin is now the Lord. Uh, so uh, after him, who's next in the line of succession? Well, you go back up one generation, John had a brother. Uh, that brother's dead. Uh, that brother had... Um, a son, I think. Uh, oh, yes, he of course he had a son who was the heir, um, uh, and he uh, he was the one who was killed by the Mad King. Um, then uh, he, John Aaron, also had a sister uh, who had uh, who got married and uh, had seven daughters, eight daughters, and one son. Um, basically, Harry is descended from one of those daughters so he is and i don't know maybe you can work out what the exact relationship is is it is it first cousins once removed or something like that um it's he's it's quite a long way down the family tree um but he is technically the next in line he's um john aaron's sister's grandson um 
Martin S. Uh, does royalty, thank you again, Martin, very kind. Does royalty in the Seven Kingdoms have the distinction of Queen Regnant versus Queen Consort, uh, ruling queen versus wife of ruling king, like real world royalty? That distinction must exist in some form, right? Um, yes, it does. Um, so you have, so for example, although it wasn't. Um, it wasn't registered in the history books. Rhaenyra, when she rules for six months, she was queen. And then she had a prince consort in Daemon. Um, uh, so she was the, the ruling queen. Um, and then there are any other uh, wife of a, a royal, uh, a wife of a king would be a queen not ruling Queen, uh, the so Queen Consort. So Queen Alison, for example, was technically she was the Queen Consort rather than the Queen Regnant. Technically, Jaehaerys was the, they kind of ruled together, but Jaehaerys was the the king. Um, uh, so I think the short answer is yes, uh, they they do. Um, the issue is more about inheritance and who inherits rather than uh, is is the the principle in some places is the principle there that the that the woman could uh, rule that's the big um uh issue that uh, a lot of people keep on arguing around okay uh so <laughs> uh, Uriah Tosh saying little um uh or oh, no mol eh saying little finger would definitely be a crypto bro i i would agree with you um uh, Ranabir Mitra saying uh, salutations, salutations to you too, sir. Uh, I won't be able to join. Uh, so much love to the mods. Um, well, if you're watching this back uh, later, great to see you. Um, my question is about the battle in the waters off Gulltown during Aegon's conquest. So we're going right back to Aegon's conquest now. Please, could you describe the impact and the significance of this battle in reaching a so-called stalemate? Because personally, I don't think it was. It is said that Vegar's burning of the Aran fleet resulted in the Sisterton rising in revolt. Um, so are we to think that this resulted in the Vale forces being made to be occupied with the Three Sisters, thereby reducing the focus on the main Targaryen forces, a.k.a. Whispering Wood tactics? Um, okay, so to remind yourself of uh, the Battle in the Waters of Gulltown, which is not the um, gainiest name for a battle, it has to be said, but the, the invading Targaryens um, send a fleet off, with the Valarians in the lead um, to try and take Gulltown because Gulltown is strategically important, the only city in the Vale, the biggest port in the Vale. Um, the Arians have a fleet, they take them on. The Arians defeat the Valarians, the Valarian fleet is destroyed. Uh, Visenya on Vagar sees this and then burns the Arian fleet. So both fleets are destroyed, which makes for a kind of a technical stalemate which is where this comes from in that um there used to be two fleets and now there's no fleets and so now nobody's got a fleet so uh so that's why some people viewed it as being a draw uh the maesters in fire and blood there there's this view that perhaps um the strategic victory was for the veil because this meant that the Targaryens called off their idea. They they were hoping to take Gulltown by with a sea invasion, and that was foiled. Therefore, uh, this was a strategic victory for the um, the Vale. Um, what happened after that was that the the sisters, those islands just north of the Vale, but who owe loyalty to the Vale, they rebelled. And they basically made their own king. Um, uh, does is the idea that this then means that the Vale forces stopped looking at the Targaryens and went over and had to deal with them, uh, the the sisters uh, themselves? I mean, maybe there's an element of that, but uh, all of this we have to cycle back around to say that th that mattered nothing in the grand scheme of the war. What mattered was that Visenya got on Vagar, flew to the top of the Eyrie, and landed. And that was enough. That was what it took to get the veil to bend the knee. 
and so uh, was that was that battle uh, you know who was that battle of victory for I, I don't think it made any difference whatsoever i think it just showed the targaryens that well this army business isn't that's not as important as dragons. The dragons are what's going to be winning this war for us. And sure enough, it was. The dragons were, they won in the field of fire. Um, then, obviously, the melting of, uh, of Harrenhal. Um, they weren't as successful in Storm's End, uh, where um, Rhaenys and Maraxes had to be... Uh, uh, that there was too raining. <laughs> it was raining too much, and the dragon couldn't basically couldn't fly because uh, it was just the weather conditions were too bad, like a aeroplane grounded because of bad weather, con weather conditions, I guess. Um, and then obviously in dawn, uh, where the the Dornish people just hid. Uh, but the dragons weren't what made the difference. The dragon dragons landing. Oh, even the threat of dragons landing at Old Town, they did land at the top of the, the high tower. That was what won over the um, the high towers. The threat of the dragons was what forced the Starks to bend the knee. They saw the dragons there and thought, well, we're, we, we, have we seen what happens with the dragons? We're not going to be fighting. It was the dragons that won it. I, the battle, the sea battle, Frankly, I my my take is that it's neither here nor there. Um, let's go to a question from Michelle Ramos saying, um, "My question surrounds the possibility of a veil succession crisis. We're in the world of a song of ice and fire here. We know currently that Littlefinger is aiming to poison Sweet Robin to death and name Harry as the heir to the veil." It's, the quote that I did a few moments ago. Uh, we also know there's a theory out there that Sweet Robin is actually Littlefinger and Lysa's bastard, not John Arryn's trueborn son. If Harry the heir were to die in the tourney and Littlefinger's plan to kill Sweet Robin does work or it doesn't and it comes out that Sweet Robin is Littlefinger's bastard, where does the veil go from there? Do the Arryns of Gulltown take over or do the Lord's Declarant devolve into a war amongst themselves over who it... Uh, who should take over the veil? Are there any other Aaron heirs aside from Harry hiding out? Well, this is this is interesting. We're, we're not told when where it is next. Who's who's the heir after? Who's the uh, second in the line of succession after Harry the heir? So we don't know. The working assumption is that yes, there must be another Aaron out there somewhere. Um, you mention the Aarons of Gulltown. House Aaron has got a lot of cadet branches, we're told. Uh, so there are Aarons of various places. And most of them are quite poor, apart from the Aarons of Gulltown, because Gulltown as a city is quite a rich place. So the cadet branch of House Aaron of Gulltown is quite rich. Um, if Sweet Robin and Harry the heir, Harry Harding, both died... Um, Yes, presumably they would. There would be like another pretender somewhere who would say, "Well, I'm next in line." That would almost that would almost certainly be challenged. Lots of different people claiming that they might be the heir. Um, in a time of war, one assumes what would probably happen is whoever has the most personal power at the time would take it. Perhaps not taking the the title, mate. Perhaps calling themselves something like Lord Protector. Uh, so they're not saying that they're the actual proper lord, but they're they're going to take control for the time being. Um, so th that um, that could happen. My instinct, though, is that not initially. It, if if Littlefinger does poison Sweet Robin. Um, then I think we probably have the issue of um, uh, Harry and Sansa. Harry is therefore, he's the new lord. What if Harry dies? There's a possibility, it has to be said, there's a possibility that they declare for Sansa. If she shows herself to have leadership qualities, if, if they, if they are, do actively follow her, um, then, uh, in the same way that the uh, the Riverlanders, the Riverland lords, declared Rob 
king in the north and they said he's our king as well. Um, it's possible that the Vale Lords could do the same. And so we get the north, the Vale and the Riverlands all, or at least in theory, all um, paying homage to the Starks and saying that the Starks are their kings, in which case you probably then need somebody to be sort of the uh, the person in charge of the Vale. And maybe Yon Royce would be the person who would take it over. It, it's an interesting thought experiment, um, but it really depends on who has the power, I think is the short answer. If Littlefinger still has the power, Littlefinger will be de, de facto ruler no matter what. Um, let's go to a um, question from uh, Caius Ballerina. Uh, a theory. Number one, sweet sleep is largely lead acetate, lead sugar, and this lead is in Lysa's powder makeup. This gave her and uh, this gave her and Sweet Robin have lead poisoning. This explains her extra crazy uh, why she's crazy, um, and also his seizures and developmental delays. Traces in her milk are why her milk could calm fits like sweet sleep. This tolerance will allow him to survive his poisoning. Uh, wow, I mean, that's an interesting theory. Um, uh, so, um, Lysa's powder makeup has got uh, lead in it. Um, I have to admit, I would have to dig into this. I think it's a just fascinating theory. I've not seen any specific... Um, uh, clues that suggest that Lysa's makeup is particularly important, um, but I would have to have a look for that to see if there is. Um, I'll have a look during the next week, week or a couple of weeks actually, because I'm obviously not here next week. But uh, I'll have a look if if something does bring to mind, and I will I will bring it up next time. Um, on Sweet Robin, I think the there are many different types of poison. <laughs> Is, is the one thing that I would say. And if Littlefinger tries to poison Sweet Robin in one way and it doesn't work, I don't think that would put him off. I think that he would just find a different poison to use. So um, Sweet Robin's fate, I personally don't think is reliant on whether or not he has got uh, immunity to something. Um, I think if Littlefinger decides that he has to die, then he will die. But it's an interesting theory about the yeah the why why he might be having those seizures. Um, April May saying if Lysa is somehow a queen in the Vale, it means Sansa Elaine is her heir. Um, well, that's an interesting. I mean, all of the you get into this uh, this point whenever you get into these kind of succession questions we often approach them from a very kind of um modern perspective is perhaps the wrong way of saying it. so it, it take modern day uh the, the uk royal family um you could if you so wish you could write out a list of who's who's next in line to the throne well if the current king did die, then William wouldn't be next in line. Who's who's next in line after him? Well, then his first son, and then his second, and 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 then you work it through, and then you go back and after that lot, it's and and you can work out a list for hundreds if you want to of people, what order they are, and that is a very clear, and everybody knows and understands that. That's not how it works in Westeros. There, there, yes, there's theories about these things, but what if, uh, what if a, a, a king or a ruler decides actually, I'm going to say that person should be um, my heir. That person should be taking over after me. What, what's the same? So that's what happened with Jane Arryn after the Dance of the Dragons. Is that she said um, actually? I think. Probably the person that I want is my fourth cousin. <laughs> That's who she said. My fourth cousin should be uh, taking over. The, so some other people rose up and protested against that, as you can understand why. Um, 
so it's not as clear cut, nor are the laws surrounding it as clear cut, which is how you can get what happened with the Dance of the Dragon. Dragons is that um, was Viserys' say on who his heir was enough? For some people, it was, but for others, there's a legal precedent that she shouldn't have inherited. So it's not as clear cut. I think is the the, the main point. Um, but if it were clear cut, and if Sa if Lysa did somehow become a queen, then yes, Sansa is therefore related. In and it, th this is one of those things. Why, why, why might the Vale Lords uh, rally behind Sansa? Well, partly because there is particularly amongst House Royce, there's sympathy for the Starks, um, and also partly because yes, she is related to uh, Sweet Robin, who was their lawful lord. Um, so. Uh, that there's there are a couple of layers there as to why they might feel some kind of loyalty. Uh, let's go to question from uh, username redacted Elbert Arryn, nephew of John, could be in line, or Dennis Arryn, a distant cousin who is called the darling of the Vale. Yes, so uh, sadly, these um. Uh, th these are the people who died. So, um, El Elbert Arryn is the he was the heir. Um, he was the he was the nephew of um, John Arryn. Uh, he was the person who was with Brandon Stark when Brandon Stark rode to King's Landing and he got killed along with Brandon Stark by the Mad King. So um, th these these names are they're part of the family tree, but John Aaron lost a lot of people over a, a relatively short period of time, which is why we are going a long uh, way further out. Uh, Film Cram saying, sadly just got in, but wanted to say... Uh, that watching your 2021 streams and hearing you say wins might not be out next year is a bittersweet innocence. Uh, yeah, I can well imagine. Um, uh, well, I mean, if, if people who've watched this live stream for a while probably know, um, yeah, there was a point, and I can't remember when this was, but there was a point when I convinced myself this must be six years ago when I convinced myself that the winds of winter was quite close and I was I was hopeful maybe it was going to happen uh sort of later that year uh, th that was my sweet summer child era um I'm now very much in the realm of I'm, not, I'm never going to make a prediction now when it's going to come out and, until George R. Martin says something himself but um uh yeah I I think I can comfortably say I don't think it's coming out this year either and for those who actually did sort of digression away from House Aaron, but we'll come back. Um, for those who are wondering how far through it is and uh, leaving aside, I, I try not to engage in the cynicism side of this. I'm very aware of uh, uh, the amount of time this has taken. Uh, but for those wondering how far through he is, the last update we got from him <clears throat> uh, was um, I think about October, November not last, 2022, and at that point he was 75% of the way through. Um, then he gave another update where he's basically said, and this was a few months ago, he said uh, that he's about the same <clears throat> number of pages, he's still about 75% of the way through, um, which doesn't mean he's not writing, just as an aside. He, I, I'm sure he is writing, but his writing style is that he will he will follow his muse in a certain direction, and then if it decides that it doesn't work, then he'll get rid of... Yeah, he, he could have gone several chapters deep down the train of thought and then decide that's not worked and then put those to one side and then start again and go a different way. Um, and that means that sometimes he can go for long periods of time and actually not make huge amounts of progress. Feel free to Google the um, 
the Miranese knot, um, uh, which was how he explained what happened with the Dance with the Dragons. Or oh, actually, I did a video, uh, Why is the Winds of Winter Taking So Long? Um, if you want my take on that. Um, but yeah, he's he said that 2023 was a personal and professional disaster for him. I think the word was disaster. Um, uh, he basically didn't make any progress with the book. Um, and he said 2024, this was again a couple of months ago, 2024 is looking like it's no better. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it, we, we don't have any good news on that front. We're, we're hopeful of, uh, obviously, House of the Dragon starting in season two, starting in June. But also uh, we've got Doug to look forward to. They will be starting to film that soon. Um, I think this summer, June again, I think is when they're starting that. Expect some more casting announcements soon on that one, by the way. Um, and then uh, the stage play, the turning at Harren Hall stage play. So those are the things that we've got uh, on our um, radar. And also, while I'm saying this, um, in case you missed the news, I did say, and I will do it at some point soon, I was, I'm going to try doing a few little shorts with like, updates and in case you missed it kind of news in case you missed it uh the john snow show there was a spin-off that was uh that kit harrington himself um pitched uh that is no longer in active development it never had a green light it was always just being worked on um but he's he gave a I, th I think it must have been for another project he's involved in at the moment. Um, he gave an interview and he was asked about this and he's basically said he didn't really want to talk about this before because if he tried to, if he, if he made it a thing, then some people would love the idea of there being a Jon Snow spin-off and that would put pressure on it. And some people would hate the idea and that would put pressure on it. So he was keeping it low key, but now he can confirm that it is. Um, and I think the, the word that, all sides are using is shelved, which he and George R. R. Martin have both wanted to emphasize that something being shelved does not mean that we're never going to see it. Um, uh, it doesn't, it may mean that we see it in a different format. George R. R. Martin has sort of muttered a couple of times about graphic novels and things like that for some of these uh, shelved projects. Um, not to say that that's what's going to happen here. But Kit Harrington has said basically that there was not an idea that everybody could coalesce around that got everybody excited for this. I am taking heart from this. Um, incidentally, I, I think this is... Um, uh, I had my reservations about the, the concept. I was willing to be won over by it, but I had my reservations about it. Um, but I am taking heart from the fact that if after what what must have been three years, maybe even more of development, they realized that this isn't something that HBO and Kit and his team and George R. R. Martin could all agree on, then they're going to shelve it, which means that they're only moving forward with things that everybody's in agreement on, uh, which, as I said, I am I'm actually feeling quite happy about. Okay. Um, so that was a <laughs> Carl Karsnark, yeah. You could have summarized everything I have just said with snow show is a no-go. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Andrew Kay saying, I was never that keen on the snow idea. People had unrealistic expectations on what that season would have been, of what that season would have been, series would have been, and there is no source material. Yeah, I think the source material thing is, um, uh, that's the, that's the biggie that, as far as HBO, I think, are concerned, is that they've perhaps learned some lessons from the past, and uh, it's noticeable that the two things that have been greenlit are the two things that have got the most uh, writing on and uh, writing that has been completed. Yes, there are more Duncan Egg stories in to come, but you can you can do a, a season on the Hedge Knight, knowing that you've got the entire plot of the Hedge Knight. Um, let's um, use name redacted saying maybe an adaptation of things cut from the book maybe the princess Val, maybe princess Val makes an appearance in a final journey to the heart of winter 
uh, I mean, there the, are the plenty of ideas. Um, none of them that really personally clicked for me, I have to say. Not just those ones there, but other, I've heard other ideas about what it might have been. Um, let's talk about Corvus Codex. Um, Hi, Robert. Could you talk about House Arryn during the Dance of the Dragons, please? Amanda Collin has been cast as Jane Arryn in House of the Dragon. Um, does it have uh, a long history of female rulers? And Moon are saying, uh, when reading History of Westeros and of Fire and Blood, I get the impression that at all major events during the last 300 years, the head of the Arryns was a young boy with his mother reigning the Vale. For example, during Aegon's con conquest and also during the main series. Is that just a coincidence or is something else happening here? Um, I mean, I think it it is mostly a coincidence. Um, there is, I mean, there's also um, Jane Arryn was a, just a child during the, the first Great Council of 101. She was just a child and uh, Lord Royce was ruling. Um, so... I mean, I, I don't, don't think that there's any great plot significance to this. It's just a thing that sometimes happens. Um, do they have a long history of female rulers? N no, not that we're aware of. Um, Jane Arryn obviously is there. Um, but going back all of these other people, when I was going doing the history, there, there weren't any particular names of women uh, who stood out there. Um, I mean, as, I, as I've often say, with, even with male preference primogenitor as a way of deciding who should inherit, which is what very roughly most of Westeros seems to cover, Dawn is an exception, uh, but very roughly that's what most of Westeros seems to go with. Um, even with that, you can still get female rulers every now and then. And um, the, the example, again, to use the British royal family. Uh, we, we've had plenty of queens ruling the uh, uh, ruling the land. Elizabeth the first, Elizabeth the second, Victoria, Queen Mary. You know, you can you can name them all. There's there's lots of them. Um, there are more men because it's male preference, but that doesn't mean that there's never a woman uh, in charge. So that seems to be what happening here with uh, Jane Aaron. Um, Diego Godoy saying, Hola, Robert, a character that I don't see, and hola to you, I don't see discussed often is John Arryn's heir before Robert's Rebellion, Albert Arryn. Could you please discuss what we know about him? What's the family tie that made him the heir for a period of time? Thanks. Well, he was nephew, and John Arryn didn't have any children of his own. That is the simple. And his dad had died. Um, so uh, John Arryn's heir had been his brother, and then his brother had a son. That was Elbert, and uh, and then he died, uh, and Elbert was then the heir. What do we know about him? Not a lot. He, again, he's one of those characters who died before Robert's Rebellion, but he he wasn't central to the action. In fact, we don't really know much. We don't know for sure why he was a part of Brandon's party. Um, so uh, Brandon appears to have headed out from River Run, where he was going to get married. Um, and then whatever he discovered, he discovered, uh, was told that um, Rhaegar abducted Lyanna, and then he headed with his friends down to um, King's Landing. Now, we did, the, the friends he had, he had a squire, um, but uh, when you get Elbert out in, he's he's a peer, really. Uh, Brandon was the heir to the north, Elbert was the heir to the Vale. Um, so maybe they were friends. Um, that's the most likely thing we can see. Maybe, maybe Elbert, I mean, he he presumably was with. Brandon already, let's see, he kind of met up with him part way along the way. Um, the the implication has to be that he's, Brandon was clearly very hot-headed, um, and uh, it takes some uh, 
chutzpah, let's say, to uh, go to uh, the king and demand that he put hands over the heir to the throne because uh, he thinks that he, he did something to uh, to Brandon's sister. That um, that takes something, uh, and that's what Brandon did. And uh, the fact that Elbert was with him when he was an equally important person um, probably also tells us something about him as well. Maybe he was hot as hot-headed as, as Brandon, or maybe he was easily led. Um, we don't know. We never meet him. We never see him in any POV, ch POV chapters. What we can probably say is that he wasn't a, just sort of a boring, bookish, stay-at-home kind of person, because otherwise he wouldn't have charged uh, down the road so fast with um, Brandon to go and confront uh, the Mad King. Um Let's go to uh, oh, uh, Chris uh, saying sorry that I'm off topic, but I don't think I've ever seen the video address. Who sent the cat's paw dagger? Thoughts? Uh, love your work, by the way. Well, thank you. Uh, well, stay tuned. I mean, that's that's actually quite bizarre. As I, the, the, I, um, I, I, I did one ages ago on this. Um, it was one of the ones that I've taken down because I've had a few more thoughts on, um, and it's going to come back up again soon. I, I can't remember when it's going to be um, at some point in the next two or three weeks. So keep an eye on the main channel, and you will get your wish. Um, yeah, I, I wish I could. <laughs> wish all requests for videos were that easy. Yes, I, I have literally I've written one, and I'm um, I, I've recorded it so it's now just a matter of turning it into a video um uh, king of imps saying hello robert uh my question uh oh, actually i'll spoil the, i'll spoil it for you if, you if you're interested um uh because you asked, uh, asked asked this here i will i will tell you um uh, just watch the video as well um uh always like spoiling my own videos in advance but in terms of who sent the cat's paw dagger um the tv show kind of implies it was Littlefinger. Um, the books uh, don't. The books uh, strongly suggest that this was Joffrey, um, who uh, who hired the um, uh, the assassin. Um, I won't go into all of the logic behind it, but the one one of the things which um, caused me to sort of uh, redo and update the video um, as well as the fact it was a very old one and, and needed to improve the audio quality and a whole load of other things but um, one thing I recently found was um, George R. R. Martin himself had been asked uh, about this um, this was um, in advance of um, uh, Feast for Crows I think um, uh, no, a storm of swords. In advance of a storm of swords, he was asked about uh, this and whether we, as readers, should have um, figured out who uh, who hired the assassin. And he said uh, that he thought the clues were all there, but then he'd obviously been writing all of this, and so perhaps he uh, he sees things on attaches significance to things that we don't but and this is the crucial thing but he says in um a storm of swords uh you you will find out um and if you look in a storm of swords uh, the bits that are related to this are that Jamie and Tyrion both independently try and work out who did this and they both come to the conclusion that it was Joffrey there's a whole load of other imagery in there that I've, I've uh, included in for the uh, this sort of redone video, um, which I thought was fascinating. But I ultimately, if you just come down to, to what George Martin he said, you will learn who did it in this book, and then in that book you get Tyrion and Jamie, who know Joffrey well, both saying, "Yeah, it was him." So I think we can be pretty sure that that's what it, what it was or who it was. Um, 
Okay, uh, King of Imps saying, uh, my question, hello Robert, my question is more about House Targaryen than Arryn, but House Arryn is certainly involved. Queen Alison marries uh, uh, Daela, 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 I never know how to pronounce that one, to Lord Arryn, uh, despite him already having heirs, uh, meaning any children from the Union would not be in immediate line of succession for the Vale. Similarly, Viserra is betrothed to Lord Manderley, who has been married four times already. Viserra um, dies before they are wed, but presumably any children that might have resulted from that marriage would have been far down the line of succession uh, for White Harbour had there been any. Is this a deliberate policy by Alison and Jaehaerys to ensure good marriages for their children but not have Targaryen descendants inherit the greatest houses in Westeros? What reason could they have for not having their grandchildren be reigning lords? Um, okay, interesting one. So going back to the reign of Jaehaerys and Alison, the the thing that within the context there we have to remember i think is that whereas we look back at jaharis and alison and go at the end of jaharis's reign and rule there was a succession crisis because um nobody knew who should be ruling because so many of these target all their children died and uh, the the succession picture was so very confused they had to have a great council to sort it all out that wasn't how it felt like at the time at the time while they were reigning they had i think it was 13 children all all told um and the so they felt they had a surplus they had lots of children um and they were very clear about so the first few the oldest children they were very clear about who they should be marrying um the further down the line of children, the the less strong they were. So Dela or Dela, she um I talked about this one a little bit earlier in the stream. Basically, uh the person that they wanted her to marry, that was a no. Uh they tried a few other people, no. Um, and so eventually they said, Well, here's a few different options. Who do you go for? And she she picked uh she she picked Roderick uh, Aaron so um that's why that was there and then the viscera being betrothed to lord manderley um we we're, we're told the reasons for this actually in fire and blood or um Jaehaerys and Alison's reasons for this um and it's not about uh we want a Targaryen to be part of the royal family it's a it was just about binding families together strengthening ties with the north they were very concerned that they, that they had didn't have strong enough ties with the north they had reasonable ties with a lot of pardon me the seven kingdoms but not the north and so the thinking was that the Mandalays are the second most powerful family in the north um and so marrying into them who 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 else could they marry they could have married a a younger son or something like that but actually marrying the lord himself that was a that was a sign of strong intent so uh, it wasn't when they reached that point they thought well these are these are just i mean I probably didn't think of it in quite these terms but these are spare children in terms of marriages and if we're we're thinking what do we want to achieve from these well Dela was just marrying someone um literally Jaehaerys gave Alison a deadline for the end of the year she has to be married by then or I'm just going to send her off to the Silent Sisters and let her have a career there instead um uh and then when uh when we reach uh Viscera then that was it wasn't about I, I want to um, create a sort of a linked dynasty over with House Manderley. This was a uh, one of my youngest daughters uh, to be married to the Lord there, uh, who was very rich and very powerful and very important and uh, a part of the Seven Kings and we hadn't been linked to before. Um, OK, I've got one more question from uh, my patrons uh, and after that I will go through the chat and pick up as many questions as I can so now is a good time to drop some questions into the chat um, uh, Brandy1842 saying do you think uh, 
it has any significance in the story that the first death in the prologue is a man from the Vale. I think he was from House Royce. Is that random, or does the Vale and with it House Arryn have a connection to the other's plot? Well, we covered this a little bit when we uh, last week when we were looking at House Royce, um, but very happy to talk about this again. Um, the fact that this was somebody from the Vale, I don't think that there's a, any specific, at least we've not heard at all, that there's any specific link across to the Vale as a part of uh, Westeros. Um, and the Arryns. The Arryns at the time... Uh, of the long night they weren't in westeros they were at that point they were still over in essos so they had not come the andals had not arrived by that point in time um however yes this is waymar royce the the first uh main character to as a main character in in the prologue the first significant character to die um and uh, he um the fact that he's house royce Yes, there's probably a link across with the um, the fact that they're first men. Uh, but just in terms of writing, if we're just thinking about the, if George R. R. Martin was kind of scratching his head about who is it, who who should I have as the person who dies? Well, he wanted them to be a a, a sort of a lord of some kind, um, but he couldn't. They couldn't be a Stark because. Um, a Stark being uh, killed and lost north of the wall that creates a, a significant thing. The the Great Ranging was in part to find where Benjamin Stark was. Um, uh, it it couldn't be any of the the big other massive first rate houses, or they would be up in arms about what happened to our the son of our house. Um, the the night's watch as a whole has is is on the decline and not many people choose to go up there so um that probably means just first men houses um again he probably didn't want it to be a house in the north because that might try and in our mind tie in with a specific one there which leaves just a handful of others house blackwood possibly but the blackwoods he may well already have had in his mind that they have got significant uh, other themes going on so house royce seems to work perfectly to fit all tick all of the little boxes that he had so that i think is is why i don't think it was a, a specific link across to anything in the veil um uh, Chris saying, I've heard it said that George R. R. Martin favours either the Brackens or the Blackwoods. I'm only halfway through Swords, so perhaps it will be become clearer. Um, uh, but uh, it's good that their rivalry, uh, but their rivalry will become relevant. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I won't spoil things for you. Uh, but yeah, the the, the Blackwood and Bracken uh, rivalry um, is. Uh, is significant and goes on through the ages of this story, not just in the Song of Ice and Fire, but across uh, the history of Westeros. Um, having a quick flick back through um, the chat. Uh, April May saying the Dustins are low key the true rivals in to, in power to House Stark. It was the Dustins who actually sent men to war for the dance. Uh, the Starks screwed the Dustins at that time. Um, are they the rivals for power? I'm not sure I would say. I mean, they probably view themselves as as being more significant than the rest of the North does, if this if that makes sense, in that their their house, the the Dustins Barrowton, is built on top of the barrow of what they say is the uh the the tomb of the the uh the first king of the first men um so uh they claim basically they are guarding and they are at the home of where uh the the first i mean the the og first man king is uh so they think that that is um very significant not many of the other northern houses seem to think of it as being as significant as they do um, but they're not, uh, although they are a, a powerful house, they're not um, 
they're not as rich as the Mandalays, nor as sort of strong as, say, the Boltons. Um, they're they're sort of up there. If you had to like put the Castarks and the Umbers house dust in or along that kind of level, I would say. Um, Andrew K saying it's crazy to. Think about the Arons and Starks we associate as quite close per recent generations, yet they literally fought each other for millennia at one point. Yet yeah, over the, the sisters, um, uh, April May saying the Dustins were very powerful until the dance, and they had a downfall uh, of a sort. Um, and uh, yeah, I think with that, I'm probably caught up with the chat. Um, so just to let you know what's happening over the next uh, few weeks. So next week, just to remind you, um, I, I am not here. Um, uh, it's the last time I'm skipping a week until hopefully Christmas. So we get a nice long run. Uh, we'll have uh, House of the Dragon live streams. We'll have... Uh, Rings of Power live streams when we get close to that as well. Um, uh, in terms of videos coming out, I honestly can't remember what I've got coming out. But that the uh, uh, the who who hired the cat's paw dagger? Someone was asking me about that. That video is definitely coming out quite soon. Um, and I'm also working on one about the prologue to the Winds of Winter, what I think is going to be in the prologue to the Winds of Winter. So keep an eye out for that one coming soon. And, oh, yes, Varys. Uh, we're going to be doing a, a few little dives into what what what's motivating Varys. What's he about? What's he trying to achieve? What is this great plan he has with Illyrio um, that seems to be changing all the time? Is there a common thread that runs through it all? I think there is. Um, uh, but just trying to set all of that and the Fagon Young Griff stuff as well. We're trying to get all of that bit uh, set up. So uh, those videos are all to come. Uh, Connor F, thank you very much. Just saying thank you for the uh, fantastic content. I appreciate that uh, uh, very much. Um, so I'll be back in two weeks and let's round off. We'll we'll do one on the veil as a whole. Any other questions about any of the other houses that we haven't really been covering uh what's house grafton about what about the the mountain clans um are there any other smaller the wainwoods i mean you let me know what you're interested in there and we will cover them off um and so that's in two weeks time and then after that we'll probably do a lord of the rings one but that is all for this time if you are interested in watching some more of these live streams there's a link to the playlist somewhere around here. If you're wanting to support this channel, thank you, first of all. Uh, but the best way to do that is through Patreon, and the link is going to appear somewhere around there. So that's all for this time. Take care, everyone. I'll see you soon.